If you're a real estate investor or you want to be a real estate investor and you're looking for more funding for your deals, regardless of what your hard money lender will say, what your mortgage banker will say, or any credit source say, don't worry, you're at the right place. Don't go anywhere in just a moment. I'm getting ready to plug you into the funding for your deals. Well, welcome to Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. And in case you haven't picked up on it by now, I have lost my voice. Yes, I'm actually getting over bronchitis right now. But we're dedicated to bringing, bringing you the show and the content, so we didn't want to miss out on another episode here on the podcast. I've got a very, very special guest with me today that's going to be talking with you about ways to invest in real estate that I promise you, you have never heard before. Strategies and systems that will be brand new to you, whether you're a new real estate investor or you're a seasoned real estate investor. My guest name is Jared, but I'm gonna introduce him to you in just a moment after I fulfill my promise of plugging you into the funding for your deals. Well, in case this is your first time to the show, uh, we're on episode like number 104 or so. I've lost count since we kicked off the uh, podcast, but I've been investing in real estate in here in Eastern North Carolina for the past 15 years. We're in a very, very small market. Only 40,000 people are in our target market. We do two to three transactions a month and the average profit is $64,000 per deal. And so we've been doing it, as I say, for 15 years. And as of 2011, we started sharing this information with other real estate investors as well. So here on the podcast show, I have some amazing guests that come on simply donating their time to share their experience with uh, my audience here on either iTunes, Google Play, or on some of the YouTube channels. So how is it that I'm gonna plug you into the funding for your deals? You see, the first six years I was in the business, I was relying on getting funding from my local banks. And in 2009, I was cut off with no notice when everybody else in the world was cut off. And since that, or right around that time, I was introduced to this world of private money. And since that time, I haven't missed out on a deal because I did not have the money. Right now, I've got about 48 private lenders that are funding our deals. We got about seven and a half million dollars that we use from house to house on our business. And so I have got a free online class that's called Where to Get the Money Now. And on this free online class, it will show you the five steps as to how you as well can get funding for your deals, again, without relying on local banks or traditional resources. So you can check it out right here at the website when we finish the show at www.jayconner, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash all in lowercase money podcast. Jay Connor, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash all in lowercase money podcast. Get on over there after the show and take advantage of the free online class on how to get funding for your deals. With that, I'm so excited to have here as my guest, Mr. Jared Derby and uh, Jared Irby, are you there with me? I am Jay, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Jared. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me here on the show. And you're going to do most of the talking because I have got no voice today. So I hope you're in good voice. <laughs> I am today. I've been there, been there, done that about a month ago, had the same thing. So I, I'll do the talking. Excellent. Well, before I bring you on and, and uh, interview you, Jared, let me tell folks a little bit about you. You've been investing in real estate now for about 10 years, but you've really jumped in with both feet the past three and a half years. I know you're very, you've been an entrepreneur all your life. You uh, had two startups that you took to over $10 million per year in revenue right from the gate. And you're a smart guy. I mean, you went to the University of South Alabama on an academic scholarship. I went to Wake Forest University on a wing and a prayer. I'll tell you, it wasn't on an academic scholarship. <laughs> When you talk about the college, you might have ignored the part where I dropped out after a semester. So I was on the four and a half year plan myself. But you know no. what I've discovered, Jared, after interviewing a lot of entrepreneurs, the most successful entrepreneurs that I've come to know, and of course, you and I are in a very, very high end mastermind group of real estate investors together. It's great really getting to know you about two weeks ago. And what I've discovered about very successful entrepreneurs is they were not the straight A students. 
most of the time, you know, academically in college. Would you agree? I would agree. I, I got pretty good grades in school on tests, but I never did the homework. So the averages were never there. But but yeah, I agree. I don't I don't really think that the formal education has a ton of connection with how successful you are as an entrepreneur. I couldn't agree more. Um, And so before we jump in, I just want my audience to know um, that they are listening and perhaps watching you, a guy who doesn't just talk the business, but you do the business. I mean, you have flipped hundreds and hundreds of houses. You You not only do single family, but you also do commercial as well. You've acquired hundreds of apartments and rental units been involved in tens of millions of dollars in transactions. And when you're not being passionate about your real estate, you're passionate about your two young daughters. And I do know this, you and your business partner flew in your own private plane to our mastermind meeting a couple of weeks ago. So that's pretty cool. So Jared, I appreciate you being here. One thing I didn't mention in the introduction is you're a sales and marketing guy. And some years ago, you ran a pretty large call center that you oversaw like a couple of hundred different people doing sales over the telephone, right? Exactly. Yeah. I, uh, well, my last job where I didn't own the company or, or didn't end up owning the company was McDonald's. So yeah, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. Started a call center with the guy and it kind of grew and grew and grew. And, and so really that's all I've ever known is sales and marketing. And because uh, uh, that's really what drives that entire business. Sure. So how did you get involved or interested in real estate? Well, I'll tell you, I I kind of probably got into it a lot of the ways most people probably do. You know, they heard somebody say, hey, real estate's a good, you know, a great investment, you know, do some research, you know, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and really, you know, kind of saw the numbers, how it makes sense, you know, as far as either rentals or flips and things like that. And I kind of just dove in and, and really, if I'm being honest, the real catalyst was I saw a, I saw one of these flip this house show. I think it was that, that kind of first one. And I think the guy's actually maybe from uh, North, up your way, North Carolina or so he had a helicopter. He's, you know, having his kids jump into the water off the helicopter while he's flipping houses. And I was like, I want to do that. So, uh, you know, that's kind of, kind of was my first say, said, Hey, that's, uh, that's something that I want to do. So I kind of always had that in the back of my mind. And, and then my other business was generating a little bit of cash and I decided instead of blowing it on, you know, cars and, and things like that, maybe I should uh, be smart about it and invest in real estate and, and ultimately, you know, started buying a few rental houses here and there. And then, flipping a few houses and then over time it just accelerated faster and faster and and we're kind of where we are now. Right. So where are you investing right now? So I live in Mobile, Alabama, which is uh, right on the Gulf Coast, kind of between Pensacola and New Orleans. And we invest all through Mobile and Baldwin County. Baldwin County is uh, where Gulf Shores and Orange Beach is. And then all the way over into Pensacola as well that we've just started. We just started over in Pensacola in the last month or so and uh, kind of expanding east and westbound into Mississippi as well. Right. So how about give uh, my audience an overview of what does your operation look like? And what I mean by that is, so employees, team members, you know, from visiting with you in person a couple of weeks ago, as far as your involvement in the business, clearly you've got it automated. You got your business automated on a very, very high level. But what's your operation look like? People, et cetera. Sure. So the current setup we have is me. I'm kind of the visionary of the operation and kind of, you know, steer it in the right direction and and, and kind of focus on growth opportunities and things like that. Then I've got Ren Bartlett, who you met. He's our COO, director of operations. And he's more of that nuts and bolts guy that actually you know, a person that can take my crazy ideas and get them done. Uh, So he oversees the whole operation. Below him, we have a director of sales. He's basically our sales manager that handles overseeing the lead people and also the acquisition folks. We've got three acquisition reps. Those are the guys that actually are guys and gals that actually go out and talk to sellers, negotiate prices, find us deals. The lead managers, I think we have three of those right now. They're actually kind of taking the inbound phone calls from off of our marketing pieces. Then we've got, we've got a, a great office assistant that helps us out with everything. We've got a dispositions team that consists of a disposition manager and, a, and he has an assistant as well. And they focus on actually selling our properties wholesale, but also getting the deals closed as well, kind of 
you know, handling the transaction coordinator coordination. And then my mom is actually our uh, accounting person and bookkeeper. So she kind of handles all that stuff. So yeah, we've got a, a pretty nice size operation at the moment. And you really started putting this operation together. You said like, what, less than three years ago? Yeah, I would say really, yeah, about three years ago, but really maybe two years ago is when we started to add on, you know, more than just me and an assistant, about probably the last two years. Gotcha. Well, that's phenomenal. So let me unpack what you just said to make sure I got it right. So the audience has got it right. So having your business set up on automatic looks like this. You've got, you're the visionary. So you like to see where the organization is going, what can be improved what needs to be pruned, et cetera. You got REN COO that's hands on in the operations. You got a director of sales. Now your director of sales, does the director of sales oversee the acquisitionist and the lead managers? Well, he mostly oversees the acquisition uh, reps and also the dispositions, basically the two sales positions. We, we consider our acquisition reps as sales because they're selling, you know, on why to go with our company. So he oversees them and, and he comes from a big car dealership background. He was a sales manager at a big car dealership. And so, you know, he really focuses on doing daily training with them, role playing, you know, really just helping negotiate, you know, the, the big, the big deals, things like that. Gotcha. So you got lead managers and acquisitionists. So let's talk for a moment about how the lead managers and the acquisitionists interact with each other. So what do the lead managers do and what do the acquisitionists do? Because just to make sure I'm clear, the lead managers are, are working on buying houses and the acquisitionists are working on buying houses, right? Gotcha. Yeah, absolutely. And so I guess you know, let's roll back to, you said it's on autopilot, right? This is always kind of a, a work in progress, right? So we're still, you know, sanding off the rough edges here and there and, and things like that. But for the most part, part, it's fairly smooth. And so recently and over the past year, we've really integrated the, the lead managers to work much closer with the addition reps. So what the lead manager does is they handle the lead when it comes in, the caller, when it comes in from the point where we market, generate a lead, all the way to setting an appointment. And, and then even once they set an appointment for the lead manager, they're still handling, you know, getting some comps together, things like that for the acquisition manager. Then at that point, the acquisition manager goes out, builds a relationship with the customer, you know, makes them an offer and, and basically completes the appointment. Well, then after that, the acquisition rep is following up with, with the person if we don't close the deal right then. But then after a period of time, the lead managers are also following up with those same people as well, you know, for the next year, two years, however long, you know, until we buy the house, essentially. Right. So the lead managers are taking the incoming calls from motivated sellers and the acquisitionists are actually, they're field reps. They're actually going out in the field. Lead managers are telephone acquisitionists are going in person, right? Exactly. Yeah. The lead managers, they're a hundred percent in the office on the telephone. The acquisition reps just come in for meetings in the morning. I'm making phone calls throughout the day, but they're mostly out in the field face to face with sellers. So at what point does the acquisitionist speak to the motivated seller for the first time? Is there a telephone introduction or do they just meet them for the first time in person at the house? You know, we try to call uh, before we actually go out to the house, then they can just introduce themselves, kind of go ahead and, and set up a little rapport, you know, see if there's anything, any other kind of due diligence or anything we need to do before we get out there, because ultimately we're going out to buy that house on the spot. So they do call and kind of, you know, set up the process a little bit, make sure that they know the information, connect with that seller. I'd say 90% of the time. Uh, you know, and occasionally, um, you know, if we have a, a seller that's out of town or something like that, we'll just go ahead and as soon as we know that we have a motivated seller on the line, we'll send them over to an acquisition rep if it's not one that we're going to be in person. What is your criteria for determining as to whether uh, and who makes the decision? Who makes the decision and what's your criteria for determining as to whether it's worth the, the time for an acquisitionist to actually get out of the office and go to the house. Well, so here's how I look at it. I look at if somebody's calling us off of our marketing piece, then they're motivated in some way, right? Now, 
that can be warm or cold, but they have some motivation to call us because, you know, our marketing is very clear that, you know, we're not retail buyers. We're not paying, you know, top dollar, but we can do it quickly. We can help solve problems, things like that. So I'm assuming if they call us that they're motivated in some way. So how we look at it is we look at basically equity, motivation, and time frame. You know, so, so, so we ask some qualifying questions, but we want to see, do they have some motivating factors? Are they, is, is the house in bad condition? You know, have they inherited the house or have they moved out of town? Do they have tenants? Things like that, that would, you know, do they have health problems? Why are they selling it? We're, we want to hear, you know, some kind of motivation talk is, is kind of how we look at it. And, and that's more of an art than a science, to be honest. But our default is to assume that if they're calling us, they're motivated. Then we look at equity. You know, we, we want to find out how, how much is the house worth approximately. You know, we, we kind of just guess that uh, at this point. And if it looks like, you know, the mortgage is 40 and we could probably pay 40 or 50, we're going, you know, to that appointment. And uh, same thing with time frame. We want to know, hey, can you sell it in the next 30 to 90 days? You know, if if they're two years out, we're going to put that person on a follow-up schedule, you know, to always kind of follow up, you know, occasionally we get somebody that says, Hey, I'm moving next year. That's probably not somebody we're going to be out to today, but we want to know, Hey, do you actually want to sell it? You know, do you have some underlying need? Even if you don't tell us you have a need, does it look like in our judgment that you have some need to sell it and can you sell it? So do you actually have the equity in it to, to be able to sell it? If you owe a hundred and we can only pay 50 to us, we're just going to go ahead and on the phone say, Hey, can you bring money to closing? If they can't, then we're, we're, we're going to kind of give them some other options and refer them to a realtor, that kind of thing. Right. Let's jump ahead and we'll come back. But on your disposition, as far as your exit strategy, what are your exit strategies on the properties once you buy them or control them? Sure. So, so last year we flipped about 150 houses or bought about 150 houses total. I don't know the exact number, but it was, it's right around in there. And out of that, I would say 70%, we actually end up wholesaling to another investor, which is really where our disposition guys come in really handy on that. They're the ones who focus on selling those out of the re remainder. We actually did the flip ourselves, where we take it down you know, fix it up, resell it. And then the remainder I bought as uh, rental properties for my portfolio. So yeah. that's kind of how we operate there. So the disposition reps on the ones that we're buying in house, they're handling getting title issues resolved. A lot of these things have title issues, old mortgages, you know, lots of errors, things like that. They're tracking down. But then they're also focusing on really, you know, convincing investors that there's a value to that property, finding the right investor for the right property at the right time. So that, that's really our strategy there is it's a, it's a whole nother world of marketing and sales over on the disposition side. Right. Well, let's talk about wholesaling a little bit because you're doing both. You're, you're, are you buying all the properties or are you just, uh, are, when you're wholesaling, are you controlling them with an option or, or some such? Well, we get every property under contract. We don't use any options or anything like that. And we actually double close everything. So we always buy the property and then resell it. Sometimes we'll go ahead and buy it. Like you say, there's tenants in it. We'll buy it and then get the tenants out or get a better lease in place or whatever, then resell it to an investor. But a lot of the time we're double closing where, you know, we already have an investor lined up to, uh, to buy it. You know, it really kind of just depends on the house, the, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Well, I was going to say, tell our audience exactly what a double close and is a simultaneous close the same thing as a double close? Well, I consider a simultaneous close the same thing as a double close. I don't know, you know, state by state if that varies, but, but basically we buy it one minute and five minutes later, resell it. And, and so we, we kind of stay, you know, we don't do assignments or anything like that very often. We're focused mostly on, on double closing, not to say that you can't assign deals, but we like to stay in control of the whole process on both sides. And I think also from a compliance standpoint, it makes sense to purchase everything and then resell it. I was going to say, um, I think I heard you say at our mastermind meeting a couple of weeks ago, the areas where you invest it, um, the uh, local realtor association or the laws or what have you frown on controlling with options and assigning for assignment fees. 
Well, and I, and I don't know if that's 100% accurate. You know, I just don't want anybody to misconstrue that we're a brokerage company or anything like that. You know, it's not, that's not even the primary reason we do it. I don't think that there's anything illegal or wrong with assigning deals. I mean, I, you know, I mean, maybe some states there is, but Alabama is not one of those where there's any issues with doing assignments. It's just, we want to stay in control of the process, right? Like, you know, our brand is on the line with the, with the client. So we want to make sure that the check they get is from us and we're they're closing with them. We're the ones purchasing their property. You know, same thing. That investor is our client. Um, if we're if we're reselling it to an investor, most of these guys buy lots of deals from us. So we want to provide the most value to them as well by staying in control of that process and being the buffer between you know between the buyer and the seller ultimately. Right. So since you are actually closing on the uh, in a, in a simultaneous closing or double close. Are you bringing your own funds or private money funds or transactional funds, or are you doing the double close where the buy, your investors' money is actually an escrow and it's their money that's actually funding the front end of the deal as well? We do all of the above. I mean, I love when we can, uh, you know, when we can use uh, investor money. It's uh, it's kosher in Alabama to do that. So. I know different states have different rules, but in our state, it's kosher to do that. So we always like to see the investor money in escrow before we close on it, you know, depending on the house. But, you know, occasionally we have to take one down ourselves too and wait a week to sell it or, or, or whatever. There, it just varies, but I definitely, I love the simultaneous close where we can use the, uh, the seller funds for sure. Right, right. So for the deals that you're closing yourself, and having your own funding lined up, how are you funding those deals? You know, we use a combination, probably like everyone else. We use, you know, investor cash, bank lines of credit, our own personal cash, private money lenders, and then hard money lenders as well in our local areas. So kind of a combination of all of those. The private money lenders are, they're really our partners and help us out the best. So if that's available, and it usually is, we tend to go that route. Got you. Well, let's do something now, Jared, where, where you will give value to the entire audience, regardless of their business model when it comes to investing in single family houses. And here it is. So regardless of our exit strategy, regardless if we're, as whether we're staying in the deal, we're going to wholesale the deal, we're going to rehab it and flip it. Regardless of that, we have got to find the deals, right? Whether we're yeah. going to whether we're going to an investor or ourselves or whatever, we got to find the deals. So pull the curtain back for us and our audience and tell us what are your favorite and best strategies right now that you're using to find a uh, hot deals. So let me, let me preface all this by saying there is no magic bullet to this, right? This is oh, one no. No, <laughs> yeah. no unfortunately, I'm, <laughs> so I'd love to, you know, and actually I take that back. There is a magic bullet and it's just massive action and execution, right? So that's our marketing approach. And so we're doing, you know, we're doing everything that everybody else is. We do direct mail. We do ringless voicemails, uh, cold calling, knocking on doors, driving for dollars, list stacking where we find out if multiple people or, you know, people are on multiple of our lists, like is somebody getting a divorce and declare bankruptcy, you know, then we're really contact, we're skip tracing those people and just cold calling them. We're doing paper clicks, we're doing SEO, we're doing bandit signs. I know you're a fan of those. So we're doing kind of a little bit of, of everything. We've even done radio advertising. We're dipping our toe into TV advertising right now. So there's, there, there's a million ways to do it, but I'll tell you why I think we get deals when other people don't is because we're hitting from every channel in a very consistent way every single month you know, day in, day out, we answer the phone when they call and, and we're just, and, and another one of our big lead sources is referrals from agents. And honestly, until three years ago, that's how I got every single one of my deals ever, you know? So everybody says finding deals is hard. That's just never been my problem because I think of our approach with the massive action behind it. Yeah, that makes sense. In fact, that's what Dan Kennedy teaches as well which I'm sure you're a follower of Dan Kennedy. So 
You talked about, uh, so a couple of these methods that you just mentioned, one you mentioned was knocking on doors. Yeah. So I have been, uh, Carol Joy and I, my wife and I, we developed our own foreclosure system of tracking foreclosures, notices of default. We started doing that 15 years ago. We got a fantastic sequential direct mail uh, letter campaign, but I know we're leaving deals on uh, the table where there's, there's deals we're not helping people because, you know, not everybody responds to direct mail. So we've never knocked on doors. So if you were going to give a three minute seminar right now on what you have learned about knocking on doors, how does that work? What's it look like? What's the approach when you walk up and knock on somebody's door? Well, okay. So I think the approach number one is you got to target the right houses too, right? Like you're, when you're doing your door knocking, you're targeting, you know, pre foreclosures, right? That's somebody that's, you know, already going to be a motivated seller, you know, statistically, right? So I don't think there's any point in going into the nicest house in the nicest neighborhood and knocking on their door. They're never going to sell it to you for 50 cents on the dollar. What we're looking for is we're looking for, you know, occupied properties as we're driving around. Normally, we're already out on some kind of appointment in that area. We see a house that looks vacant or doesn't look vacant, but should be vacant, you know, and then just walking up, telling them who we are and, you know, just asking them about the situation with the house. You know, but we don't just knock and say, hey, would, would you be willing to sell your house? We walk up, say, hey, you know, this is Jared with Irby Home. I, I'm Jared with Irby Home Buyers. We were looking at another house in your neighborhood to buy. I was just curious the situation with your house and just let them talk. You know, we're in the South, so people are a little more friendly, maybe. But I think this probably works anywhere as long as it's a decent neighborhood, you know, and, and it's just a, a real really good way to connect with people. And so we look for identifying issues like that. Then we go build a connection and just ask them what the situation is. And, and these have led to a lot of, uh, a lot of good deals. It's not our number one deal source by any means, but you know, we, we bought one you know, a couple months ago where our acquisition rep was on the street looking at another property and she sees that there's an estate sale going on where they're selling all the antiques and junk out of the house. And she just walks up, starts talking to the, uh, the person running the sale. Uh, th this happened at a yard sale too. And what's going on, found out like an inherited house situation and bought the house right then. You know, so the house wasn't advertised for sale. They, they, were, they wanted to clean it all out first, then stuff will we'll take it just like it is with all the junk in it. So it's, it's really finding, finding houses that need a solution and then providing the right solution, right? That's, that's what this business is all about is you're never going to buy one that has no hair on it. That's easy breezy. They're not going to call you up and say, Hey, here's my hundred thousand dollar house for 50 grand. Just write me a check in 60 days. That's not how it works. We got to find ones that have problems with it. And then we present a solution, you know, to that problem. Yeah, I want to emphasize something you just said, and I teach my students and my acquisitionist does it as well, and that is when we get a response to any kind of our marketing from a, that we're marketing to off-market houses for sale by owners, and after we've established a little bit of rapport, one of the very first or the very first question we ask is what you just said. Well, Tell me about your situation or tell me the situation, the situation. What I love about that question is there's over a hundred different ways they could start answering that question. They could start answering the question on tell me about the situation or your situation. They could tell you personally what's going on, you know, lost a job, whatever. They could be talking about the house and the problems that the house has. But here's the point. When we ask somebody, well, tell me about your situation, whatever it is they start saying that is their hot button. That's what's in the foremost of their mind. And therefore, that's the framework. That's the piece that we want to come back, back to when we're closing the deal, referring back to whatever it was their situation was and how we're going to solve that problem. Because after all, that's what we are. We're not house buyers. We're not real estate investors. We're problem solvers. And until we understand that's the business we're in is helping solve people's problems, which means helping them get rid of their pain and moving them to some hope. That's when we can really start making a difference. Well, Jay, I, I completely agree. 
you know, on, I've got a big jacked up uh, 2500 HD pickup truck with big wheels and bumpers and stuff like that, you know, because I'm in the south and it's fun. But we wrapped it with I buy houses on it. And on the side of it, it says real estate problem solvers, because that's literally what we are. You know, we're nobody calls you up and says, hey, I need well, this has happened, but it doesn't happen often. But they don't call you up and say, hey, I'm going to jail and I need 20 grand. Take my house, you know. It happens when you do massive action, but we had to do hundreds of deals before that happened. Your, your average investor starting out is not gonna see that, right? Until they do tons of deals. But what I will say is going even a step further, you know, not just, you know, you know we're, we're practicing very active listening. So we wanna, when they say something, like a seller told me the other day, I just took a, I just had to show my acquisition reps how it's done still. So I took a couple calls and, and that kind of thing. And the other day, a seller, I was trying to set an appointment with him and he was working around a bunch of different doctor's appointments, right? He never told me he had any health problems, but you know, he said, well, I have a doctor's appointment this day, a doctor's appointment this day and a doctor's appointment this day. You know, to me instantly, they don't just tell you what's up you know, but, but I connected those dots enough to say, well, hey, is, is, is everything okay? You know, health issues. And turns out lots of health issues have a tenant in there that's not paying and the house needs a ton of work. He's used to doing all the work himself. It's not a money issue. He has money, you know, doesn't need the money so much. We need to solve this problem for him of having this non-paying tenant. He's having health issues. It needs a lot of work. It's a huge management issue. So it's really kind of connecting the dots on what they tell you and what they don't tell you too. So, so, it, so I look at it as next level acquisition reps and next level lead management is really kind of a Jedi trick. It's, it's really looking at actions and not even just spoken words. Well, you know, if, if somebody calls and tells you, well, I don't need the money, then we'll say, you know, I think your best option is to actually renovate this house yourself. I'm happy to refer you to some contractors who will give you a fair price. I think you could sell it for $100,000 if you put 20 grand of work into it. And, you know, if they say, well, I don't want to do that, then, you, you, you know, they might not have told you why, but they, their actions through that have kind of told you, hey, there's probably something deeper under there. Maybe it's not a money issue. Maybe it's an age issue or a time issue, or there's so many problems out there and you will never know what they all are. And so you really drill down, ask very deep, very intentional questions and don't just scratch the surface. You know, um, if somebody tells you they're having health problems, dig in and be their friend and, you know, offer them advice, offer them help. You know, you're, you're more of a counselor than anything. And you got to draw out all the problems before you can present a really good solution. For them. Yeah. Yeah. I came to realize years ago in this business, a lot of times and deservingly so, some real estate investors get a really, really bad rap and they should because it's like any business or any industry. If I am in business and I am more interested in what I can get out of this than what my person that I'm supposed to be serving is going to get out of it, I'm not going to be successful. I'm a firm believer in the law of reciprocity. The more I'm able to help people, I don't have to worry about me. It's going to come back somewhere. And, you know, as sometimes real estate investors get the wrapper out there to take advantage of people, you know, that's called nothing but greed. And if somebody's in this business because they have a greedy nature, they're not going to last long because the other person you're talking to can clearly read in between the lines and tell, you know, really where your heart is coming from. Before we wrap up the show, you know, I've got a lot of in the audience, I'm sure that are newbies. They've never done a real estate investing deal before. They haven't done that first house. They haven't done any commercial properties. And so from your own experience, what's some of the best advice that you can give a brand new real estate investor that they haven't done that first deal yet. So the best advice I can give anyone is not technical. It's just massive action. You know, you've, you've got to pick your point and you just got to go at it. Just unstoppable force and a laser beam at it. You know, if you want something, you got to go get it. Nobody else is going to give it to you. And, and really that's the key. And that's the problem I see with most people, not just in real estate, but every business is, you know, we have a hard time getting realtors to pick up the phone and, and things like that, right? If you're in a business, step one is taking, is caring enough to take action and get it done. And so to me, that's kind of some of the biggest stuff right there is, you know, when you see something, a problem that needs to be solved, you need to go solve it right then, be 100% intentional about it and take massive actions towards your goals. If you have a goal 
to do a deal, you need to spend night and day figuring it out and do not stop until you find one. It's, it's not like it's rocket science. I mean, I, I can do it. You can do it. I mean, we're both not the brightest people in the whole world. I, I don't think, you know, you know, it's not that, but you know, I imagine you're like me when you want something, you go make it happen. And I think that that's probably a key for your students or anybody else listening is you know, if you want something, you've got to go make it happen yourself. Nobody's going to do it for you. You can take your advice, take all the advice of all the great people out there, take my advice. But at the end of the day, you have to go execute and you got to do it now. Exactly. Well, Jared, I know my audience has loved connecting with you here on the show. And if they would like to continue the conversation with you, how can they reach out to you and how can they get up with uh, Jared Irby? Sure. Uh, so social media is uh, Jared Irby on Facebook. Um, I, I'll send you our Instagram. You can, uh, you can share that as well. Uh, that's the best way to connect up with me. I'm happy to answer any questions, partner up. I'm always like you looking for private investors and things like that to invest in our deals. If, you know, finding a deal isn't a, is a, is an issue, you know, for, for somebody, we have plenty of deals, but we're looking for investor partners to help make some money for, you know, I also got a mastermind that, that we're starting up as well. going to be happening over the summer. It's called empireforgemastermind.com and i uh, share that, that link with you as well. I'm just happy to help and, and connect with people because I feel like teaching and giving value, you know, makes me a better person too. And, and I really want to see our industry be successful overall. And I think that that's going to take, take a lot of people like me and you giving a lot of great advice out there. That's awesome, Jared. So folks, we will have all that contact information that Jared just gave out. We'll have that in the show notes. And uh, Jared, it's just been a pleasure having you on, man. And, and so great to connect with you in person last week. I'm so excited to be in the same mastermind group as you. We get to interact throughout the year. And wow, man, you, you've got just a, a wealth of knowledge and experience. And I'm looking forward to having you back on the show again sometime soon. Absolutely, Jay. Anytime, man. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and value our friendship. I expect it to continue uh, for a long time. So great having me on. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, folks. Again, a special welcome here to Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. Again, let me offer up the free online class, 